Make sure your Bibles are still open there to Numbers chapter 16. There's a lot that goes on in those two chapters, much what I read and some other things I did not read. But in summary, if you know the general story, sometimes it gets a little complicated as you try to read through and catch all the little pieces. We find Korah and his crowd rebelling against Moses, complaining against Moses and Aaron for taking too much upon them. And we find that earth opened up and swallowed them when the confrontation came. And then a fire came out and consumed of many of the princes, 250 from that. Then we find the people raised up and they complained because the earth opened up and swallowed up the people and killed them. And so on that next morning, they started complaining as well. And God sent a plague. And many, many of those people died because of the plague. And at the end of that plague, we have chapter 17, where he says, I want you to go ahead and take a rod. So he's dealt with two sets of rebellion, two sets of people complaining and murmuring and going against Moses and Aaron, which was typical for them. And they took the rod, a rod for every tribe, and they wrote their names on it so they know whose it was and put it into the tabernacle. And the next morning, the God says, I will show you who is right, if I can put it that way, and who is wrong. Whichever one buds. Well, they pulled out Aaron's, and Aaron's not, not only budded, but it bloomed and actually produced almonds. And God said there, said, I want you to, well, let's look at verse number 10, which is the key thought. And the Lord said unto Moses, bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony. He said, you bring it back in to be kept for a token against the rebels. Again, we know a token, as we saw, been seeing the last few weeks, is a flag, it's a beacon, it's a testimony, it's a warning. He said, I want to take this rod as a token, as a reminder, as a warning, as a testimony, as a flag against the rebels. So as we're looking at this idea, it's a token against rebels. Now, just by the title, we'd say this doesn't sound like it's going to be real pleasant. I don't think it's going to be too hard. It's going to help us. Right now, I'm, I'm glad that God put this on my heart in the schedule as it is. Again, we're looking at tokens because I am not experiencing a lot of rebellion right now that I know of. Maybe I'm just deceived. Maybe I just don't know. I do see some rebellion, but it's not as overt. And so this, I believe, is more preemptive for us to help us be on guard, to help us watch out because God says, I want you to keep this rod. So when people see the rod, think about the rod, acknowledge the rod, they'll be reminded about the rebels, they'll be reminded about the direction of the rebels, they'll be reminded to put themselves on guard. By the way, that's what most of the Bible is. Many times in the Old Testament, it's just a testimony and a warning and encouragement to us to stay right, to be right, to walk with God. And so here he said, I'm going to have this token, this sign, this symbol against rebels. Many times young people don't understand, but as you get to be a parent and you watch your children grow, or you have, you're responsible for people that you love, people that you're overseeing, and you see the rebellion, the rebels, if you will, it doesn't, it should not make you angry, but it makes you sad. It doesn't upset you. How could they do this to me? Why are they doing this to me? No, the heart is, what are they doing to themselves? What are they doing to the Lord? What direction are they going to go? So as we look about the rebels, it's not you rebels, though it does say that at times in there, but the idea is a brokenness. That's why you see with Moses and Aaron, when they rebelled, they wept. When they rebelled, they cried unto God. They prayed. When people rebelled against them, Moses interceded for the people. I don't think that Korah and his crowd are the people on the next morning would consider themselves rebels. Very few rebels consider themselves rebels. They've got a cause, they've got a, a, a vision for what they want, they think they've been mistreated, or they think they've got a better way, and so they go about it. So they wouldn't call themselves rebels. God calls them rebels. So this evening, we're looking at this idea about a token of the rod, a token against rebels. 
But again, it saddens those in authority with the right heart. When people begin to go their own way, making their own decisions. So tonight as the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit would point out something in your life, and by the way, I think in everybody's life He will because it's our nature to rebel. But as the Holy Spirit points out something about rebellion and says, you are a rebel in this area. You are rebelling in this area that we will not get upset, we will not get angry, we will not fight back, but we will let the Holy Spirit do the work that He wants to do in our hearts and in our lives so that we can get right with God and not have to go the course of the rebels, that we will not have to have tokens against us in our lives. So as we look at it tonight, we're just going to learn some basic practical things that God reveals to us about the token, what the token of the rod, the token of against rebels, that it might help us. Now, just to remind ourselves, rebellion is a terrible sin. Rebellion is, it's not just a little quirk, it's not just a little personality uh, strife between people. It is a sin. We know it's been preached many times in 1 Samuel 15, 23. God says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness, which comes from and leads to rebellion, is as iniquity and idolatry. And so we have to understand it calls it witchcraft. He calls it iniquity. He calls it idolatry. Uh, God is, is, is against and warns us how wicked this idea of rebellion is. And so we're looking tonight at the token. He says, take this rod and let it be a token. Look at verse 10 again. Be kept for a token against the rebels. So tonight we're going to see what this token does for us, why God, it's a sign, it's a symbol. It is a beacon warning us. As it warns me, it must warn you as well. So are you with me tonight? We're looking at what God's going to show us about this rod, about this token. God shows this is a beacon. This is a warning. This is an instruction. This is a memorial to the rebels that we might be and learn what God has for us. So very quickly tonight, notice number one, that this token of the rod, this token against the rebels, first of all, it's to help us recognize the course of rebellion. To help us recognize the course of rebels. And we find rebellion, as much as we like to think, especially teenagers, that they're the first ones to experience rebellion. They're the first ones to figure out that the old generation doesn't know what they're talking about. They always think they're, are you out there tonight? How many remember when you were a teenager, you thought those old folks, you know, those over 30. How many remember that 30, what was the old expression? You don't trust anybody over 30. Anybody over 30 was part of the establishment. That's what the hippie generation. Yes, I came from the hippie generation. Oh, I hurt my neck. <laughs> but anybody over 30, and we thought, we, boy, we were just in its generation after generation. We're the new ones. Nobody's been like us. Nobody thinks like us. We, we've, we've discovered really what wisdom is, and we know the way. Like, so we don't, we've, there's nothing new under the sun. So we're going to look tonight and see the, the course of rebels, how they go about it, what it means, just some simple things. And that's what most of the message is going to be about, not accusing, not pointing, but helping us recognize this idea, this course of what rebels do and how they behave so we can recognize it in ourselves and others. So here we go. This, so this rod, he said, it was a token. A token. So when they would look at it, they would think about it, and they'd be reminded about it. They would say, I remember, and I know what rebels are like. Number one, we find rebellion against our God, given authority, is rebellion against God. You know, just the statement ought to make obvious sense, but it's not true in our lives. Rebellion against our God-given authority is rebellion against God. Look at verse number 11, if you would, please, of chapter 16. For which cause both thou and all thy company, he's speaking to Korah and all his company, are gathered together against the Lord, and what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? He says, you're gathered against the Lord. He said, who is Aaron that you're murmuring against him? You're rebelling not against Aaron, but you're rebelling against the Lord himself. But just the title, rebellion against our God-given authority. When God gives us authority, when it's a God-given authority, and we rebel against that God-given authority, it's obvious we're rebelling against God himself. In Exodus 16, verses 7 and 8, it says, And in the morning ye shall see the glory of the Lord. For he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. 
and what are we that you murmur against us? Did you see? Is that in your notes, Exodus 16? Notice what he says. For he heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we that you murmur against us? He said, you're murmuring against us, but God hears it as murmuring against him. And Moses said, this shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So God reminds us that when we've got the God-given authority above us, that when we murmur and we rebel against them, we're actually rebelling against God. You know, we like to focus on the individual, but God says, no, I hear it, you're rebelling against me because I put this person or these people in authority over you to help you, to guide you, to instruct you, and when you rebel against them, you're rebelling against me because I put them there. Yeah, let me help you. Not all God-given authority is always right. Is that a shock? Except us parents. We're always right. It's not always right. But there's still God-given authority. In fact, Jesus talked about that. He says, you do what those Pharisees tell you to do. He said, they don't do it themselves but you because what they're doing is they're telling you what God says. He says, they're not right. He said, but they're sitting in the place of authority. Now, let me help you some. It's never right to obey authority that disobeys God. Are you listening to me? It's never right to obey authority for authority's sake to disobey God. God always must take place. But so often we take that very thought I just said and we twist that around and say, well, I don't like it and I don't think they're really just all right about this so I'm going to rebel against it. Be careful. They're still in the place of authority. So if it's not against God or against Scripture, be careful about how you rebel. So rebellion against our God-given authority is rebellion against God. And he says, here's the rod, here's the token. He said, this to remind us, this is a token against the rebels. In Romans 13, 1, it says, Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, the power ordained by God, Resistes the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. And on it goes. Talk about for them being ministers of God. And so the idea is God gives us authority, God given authority over us. Then when we rebel against that, we're rebelling against God. But again, we can never get to, don't ever get to the place where you say, I'm going to obey my authority rather than God. That happens many times. It used to be almost a, a teaching. Just kind of sharing some things tonight. Almost a teaching. Wives are to submit themselves to their own husbands. Hello. But not when the instruction of the husband violates the will and word of God. Are, are you listening to me? Well, he wants me to get drunk, so I'm going to submit. No, no, no. He wants me to be involved in this immoral or this, this wrong thing. No, no. Do not do that. We must obey God. But if it's not disobedient to God, then we must be obeying those in authority over us. In Nehemiah 9, 26, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee. He says, They rebelled against you, God, and cast thy law behind their backs and slew the prophets which testified against them. So they had the prophets over them, testifying, teaching them, instructing them, but then they rebelled against God. Many times, again, we always think we're rebelling against the person and their control over us, but if it's God-given authority, we, if we're not careful, we are rebelling against God Himself. Teenagers, God has given you authority, a God-given authority called your parents. Your parents are, may not always be right, but as long as they're trying to instruct you in the ways of God and trying to give you instructions, trying to protect you, trying to guide them as they feel God would have them to, that's God's authority over you. And as you rebel against your parents, you're rebelling against God. Well, I don't think it's right I have to be in at 8 o'clock. So I'm just going to rebel. No, no, you're rebelling against God as you rebel against your parents. Boy, it's a little quiet in here because we all are rebels at heart. We all want to do our own things. 
It may be curfew for the teenagers. It may be for who you're dating. It may be what you wear. Oh, I don't, just be careful because when you rebel against the authority, you're rebelling against God. Husbands, when you rebel against the authority of God, or the authorities God placed above you, you are in fact rebelling against God. Wives, when you rebel against the authority over you, you're rebelling against God. All of us as Christians, when we rebel against the authority over us, we are rebelling against God. So when we choose, I want to do it this way, I know this is what the authority says, and this is what the authority desires, but you know, I don't want to do that. I want to do it my own way. Who do they think they are? And then when we rebel against that, we're rebelling against God. Now, even as I say that, the world would say, boy, there's a cult there going. There it goes. Here, have some Kool-Aid. No, don't I have the Kool-Aid. But God is saying here, they rose up against Moses and Aaron says, you take too much upon you. You're trying to do it. We're, we're just as holy. We're just, but we're going to do it our way. And he says, no, you're rebelling against God. So be careful when you say, well, I know what they want. I know what they think, but I'm going to do it my own way. Hebrews 13, 7, we know that passage. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves because they are always smarter and right. That's not what it says. Because they are perfect and much smarter than you. No. Why? For they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not grief. The motive of that God-given authority is to watch for your soul. Teenagers, your parents are there. If you've got godly parents, you ought to thank God for them, and you ought to listen to them. They're trying to watch for your soul. Church members and pastors and teachers are trying to watch for your soul. Number one, recognize the course of rebels. He said, here is a token against rebels. What is that? Recognize and remember the fact that a rebellion against God-given authority is rebellion against God. Number two, it's a reminder and recognition the course of a rebel is they practice and cause murmuring. They practice and cause what class? Murmuring. Boy, over and over, all through this time, it's always murmuring and complaining. Murmuring. Murmuring is the seed sprout of rebellion. Are you listening to me? Murmuring is that seed and that first sprout of rebellion. When you begin to say, you know, I don't like this, I don't want this, I think this is wrong, that spirit becomes out, that is that seed, that is that sprout of rebellion. Very quickly, chapter 16, verse number 11. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord, what is Aaron that she murmur against him, complain against him, talk down about him, beseech him? Verse 41. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. So after Korah was closed up, and his crowd, and the fire came and consumed the others. The next morning, the people rose up, and they started murmuring and complaining against Moses also. Chapter 17, verse number 5. And it came to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmuring of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. Verse number 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmuring from me. So we find rebels, he says, as people would remember the rod, here's the rod, it's a token against the rebels. Not only were they remember, but as they rebelled against God's given authority, they were really rebelling against God, and you never win when you rebel against God. But not only that, they practice and cause murmuring. By the way, that's a sign that you've got a rebel when a rebel, that, when somebody starts murmuring all the time and complaining all the time and starts, are we happy tonight? Oh, good. He said, it's a token. He says, they just begin to murmur. So it's a sign that maybe somebody you want to avoid. Somebody you want to say, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about something good. Let's talk about the goodness of God. Let's talk about the blessings of God. Let's talk about what God has for us here. Instead of just murmuring, it may be a sign. It may be a signal that you or I are on course for rebelling when we begin to murmur. This murmuring then brings and sprouts this idea of rebellion. So they practiced and caused murmuring. So as they murmured, they rebelled. And as they rebelled, they caused other people to murmur. Isn't it amazing how it spreads? 
I wish praise would spread as fast as murmuring. Oh, wouldn't that be something? Boy, I said, boy, did you hear what God's doing over there? Let me go tell you. Would you come here? Let me tell you what God's doing over in their life. What a blessing. Oh, what's going No, but murmuring spreads like wildfire. But it spreads, and they, as they begin to murmur and begin to rebel, so did others very quickly. Not only do they practice and cause murmuring, so we look at this token. It's a reminder. It's help us recognize the chorus of rebels and rebellion in our lives and the lives of others. They practice and cause murmuring. Here's key. They are dissatisfied with the place and purpose where God has called them. They are dissatisfied with the place and purpose where God has called them. Chapter 16, verse number 9. In other words, they're just not satisfied with what God's doing in their life. They're not satisfied with what God placed them. They're not satisfied with the authority over them. They're not satisfied with what their life is about right then. Chapter 16, verse number 9. Well, back up to verse number 8. So they came, and they, Korah and his crowd said, You guys take too much. Who do you think you are? Verse number 8, Moses said unto Korah, Hear, I pray you, ye sons of Levi. Seemeth but a small thing unto you. He said, Don't you understand the blessings of God? Don't you understand what God is doing in your life? Don't you understand what God has called you to? Seemeth a small thing unto you. He says, Don't you care about it? Don't you see it's important? That the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel. See, they didn't have their own inheritance. They were busy. They were giving a job to minister in the tabernacle, to minister with the holy things of God and to minister to people. They weren't the high priest. They weren't Aaron. They weren't Moses the leader. But God had given them that special place. Has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself. And notice what it says there, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord. He said, is that a small thing to you? Here you're rebelling and you're complaining that you think that you ought to have Aaron's job, that you think you ought to have Moses' job. You don't think they're doing it right and you're focused on that and you're rebelling against them. He said, is it a small thing that God has called you to this particular service, to do the service of the tabernacle and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? He said, you get to stand before the congregation of God's people and minister and care and teach and and lead and guide. Wow, what a great place God has placed you. What a great privilege God has given you. What a great responsibility God has given you. Verse 10, and he hath brought you thee near to him. And said, he wants you to be close to him. He allows you this special relationship and the special closeness. And all thy brethren, the son of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood only. He said, aren't you satisfied with what God has done? Aren't you satisfied with what God has called you? God had called them. God had placed them. And yet it was insignificant to them. They were not satisfied with that. I think it's there in your notes. I've got two quotes. Again, we're, we begin to rebel when we're not satisfied with the place God's put us. But here's the key. The key is not what we are called to do, but for whom we are called to do it. Are you listening to me? The key is not to what we are called to do, but for whom we are called to do it. In other words, whether it be Janitorial or pastoring. It's who we serve. It's who we serve. God in His wisdom, God in His, His path, He makes and gives us those spots, He gives us those things, and we ought to be satisfied. This is where God has for me. So it's not the what, it's the who. I'm serving God. He said, God has brought you to Himself. He's separated you from Himself to serve the people and to serve. He said, isn't that? And now He says, you want Aaron's job? You want that job? Boy, ladies and gentlemen, we begin to rebel and we begin to complain and we begin to get dissatisfied with the purpose and the position God has placed us. Because we lose focus on who we're serving. If I can paraphrase what Moses was saying, and God was saying with, through Moses to the people, the next quote, instead of longing to be doing someone else's job, seek to do our job the best. Are you listening to me? Instead of longing to do somebody else's job, 
seek to do our job the best. He said, you've got a job. God has given you a spot. God has given you a position. Do that. He said, but now you want Aaron's job? Now you want to do that? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I've got news for you. Whatever God's given us to do, we've got to do it our best. The focus is not finding some other job. The focus is doing the job God has given us at that moment and at that time, our very best. You say, well, I'm not pastor. I want to be pastor. I'm a, I'm a choir member. Well, the focus is I want to be the very best choir member God ever had. I want God to use me. I want God to bless me. I want my, my practice to be the best I can. I want my voice to sound as good as I can. I want to make sure I blend just right. I just want God to be glorified and people be brought to Christ because of my singing, not because I've done that, but at prepared their heart. Boy, do the very best we can. Well, I'd rather be pastor, but you're not pastoring right now. You're a choir member. You say, well, I'm an usher. Then you need to say, right now I'm an usher, and I'm privileged. God has placed me there, and I'm going to be set up, and I'm going to be the best usher I can. I'm going to usher for God. I'm going to greet people with the biggest smile I can. I'm going to encourage people the best I can. I want to make people feel at home the very best I can. I want to be gracious the best I can. I want to protect the congregation from issues that come arise the very best I can. You may be a Sunday school teacher. I say, well, I want to be a pastor. I want to be a deacon. I want, whoa, but right now God's got to end that spot, and I want to do the very best I can. That means 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatsoever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, I'm longing to do my job the best I can. And listen, and when we focus on that, that'll help kill those little seeds of rebellion. I am, I'm, I'm glad God called me to give me this spot. Maybe God will give you another spot another time, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to give God the glory. Ecclesiastes 9.10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. This is your time to do it. I want to do it with my might. 1 Peter 4.11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So the idea is we must focus on what God has given to us and do the very best we can. He says, he says Cora, you and your crowd, you get to minister in the tabernacle. Are you doing that right? Are the things put away like they're supposed to? Are they wrapped up like they're supposed to be? Are they ready to go? Are they in position? And God has put you in a place to minister to the people. Have you been ministering to the people? Is there people that God has put on your heart? Is there people that you need to know? He said, well, focus on your job. Oh, but he said, here's a token for the rebels. They were dissatisfied with God's purpose and place. For all jobs in the ministry, same purpose, same energy, same effort. Very best you got. Very quickly. It's a token against the rebels, he said, so the people would recognize that. So they'd recognize the course of the rebels. Of course, the rebels are dissatisfied with God's purpose and place for them. Number next, they seek to gather others to rebel with them. They seek to gather others to rebel with them. Korah didn't rebel by himself. I heard an old preacher once say, that's because they're cowards. <laughs> He wasn't going to rebel by himself. He said, man, i got to get some other people to go with me. See, now, if you've got an issue and there's a problem, you've got a cause, then you'll be willing to go ahead and stand for the things of God. But in this case, he says, no, he just was afraid to do it. They seek to rebel, others to rebel with him. Chapter 16, verse number 3. And they gathered, well, it'll be verse number 1. Now Korah, the son of Izziar, and Dalthin, and Abram, and the sons of Abram, took men. They said, we've got to get some people behind us. We've got to get some people going along with this. Verse number 3. And they gathered themselves together against Moses. Oh, they had a bunch of them together. Verse number five. And, they, and he spake unto Korah and all his company. He had a crowd with him. Verse number six. Do this do, take ye censors, Korah, and all his company. Verse number 11. For which cause both you and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. See, rebel, re rebels are always looking for somebody to rebel with them. Always looking to get somebody else going. Always looking to get somebody else involved. Always looking to get another group. That's what happened with Eve. 
She rebelled against God and sinned. She first thing she did, she got Adam and said, come on, join me. Wow. They try to gather us together. God put it this way in Proverbs eleven twenty one: Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. See, the wicked's always trying to get somebody to go along with them, always trying to get somebody involved. So that's why we have to be on guard. And when you, as a rebel comes to you and says, tries to get you to rebel also. And again, I'm not talking about not dealing with issues. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. We're talking about just rebelling and complaining, not being satisfied where we are, murmuring against other people and rebelling against the authority of God, rebelling against God's Word, rebelling about what God teaches. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand when we rebel, we're rebelling against God and many times always to our own hurt. But they gather up others to rebel. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Always seeking to rebel, others to rebel, very quickly. They seek rebellion over reconciliation. They seek rebellion over reconciliation. That rod, that token against the rebels reminded the people they seek rebellion over reconciliation. Chapter 16, verse number 12. An amazing little thought. Hope you're still with me tonight. Let's look at verse 1. Now Korah and the children of Isiar, the son of Isiar, the son of Korah, the son of Levi, and Dothan and Abram, the sons of Eliab. Okay, they all rebelled in verse number 12. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Arabim. Same ones in chapter 6, verse number 1 the sons of Eliab, which said, we will not come up. I don't know why Moses was calling them. Maybe he thought they would listen. Maybe he thought we can talk this out. Korah's not listening. Korah's the rebel. He's, he's, he, he said, but let me, let me ask these guys to come talk to us. And they said, we will not come up. Wow. They wouldn't talk about it. They weren't seeking reconciliation. They weren't seeking, well, let's see to work this out. They weren't seeking, well, maybe we can deal with it. Moses, if they weren't rebellion in heart, they'd say, oh, maybe Moses is woken up. Maybe we made an impact. Yeah, let's talk to him. Let's reconcile. Let's get this together. But see, rebels don't want reconciliation. They want to rebel. They don't want reconciliation. They want to go ahead and have their own way. That's one of the ways you can tell whether it's rebellion or somebody's trying to deal with an issue because those that are rebelling don't want to talk about it. They don't want reconciliation. They just want to say their piece. They get the anger in and get the words out and get the load off their shoulders and then go about their own business. Romans 14, 19, Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Philippians 4, 2-3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So if we're looking at our life, listen, looking at our lives, am I being rebellious? Am I being a rebel? I don't know. Are you looking for reconciliation or just your way? Are you looking for reconciliation or just say your peace? Oh. He said, here's a token against the rebels. Very quickly. The course of the rebel, they poison others. They poison others. Chapter 16, verse 41. So on just the previous section, we've got Korah being swallowed up and his crowd being swallowed up by the earth and crushing them. And then a fire comes and consumes 250 of his crowd that were following him. And the people cried and said, whoa, boy, I hope we don't get consumed. But in verse 41, but on the morrow, the day after, it's a, I'm always amazed at this. I'm just amazed. And on the morrow, after the congreg on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, ye killed the people of the Lord. So the day before, Korah and his crowd rebelled against Moses. Moses said, if, this, if I'm right, if, God, if, if I'm right, he said, I'm going to let, he said, God's going to open up the earth, they're going to fall in, and God's going to crush them, and all they got. God opened up the earth, they fell in, and God crushed all they have. And said, wow. But the next morning, they were, the rest of the people were complaining and murmuring and rebelling against them because they killed the people of God. The re rebels poisoned the others. It's an amazing thing that we often blame leadership 
for the sins and actions of others. But they poison. So as we rebel, we poison others. We put others in a different mindset. We prepare others to rebel also. Again, this, God just says, he, God's not angry. Moses wasn't really angry. It's heartbroken. He sees what's going on. And so we just need to learn the course. It poisons others. And, of course, we find their rebellion ends in death. Rebellion ends in death. Very quickly, chapter 16, verse 32. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertaineth unto Korah, and all their goods. They died, verse 35. And there also came a fire, and there came a fire from the Lord, and consumed 250 men that offered incense. Verse 41, but on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of God appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, lest I consume them as, as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And we can read down through, a plague came and killed many of them. Chapter 17, verse number 10. And and the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. Rebellion kills. Here it took their life. But we know rebellion will kill a marriage. Rebellion will kill a family relationship. Rebellion will kill a testimony. Rebellion can kill a church. Boy, it just, it just ends in death. A token against the rebel. We're all susceptible. We're all capable. We all rebel. Very quickly, the next two points are just statements. What was the token for? It was to help us recognize the, co- the course of the rebels. Number two, is to remove us from the causes of rebellion. To remove us from the cause. And what is that? Murmuring. We see all that. When we read the children of Israel and we see that rod ought to remind us, it's a warning to us, be careful about how we murmur. When you hear it yourself, when it comes out of your own mouth, no, it ought to remind us to remove the cause of us. And then thirdly, to repent us from our compulsion to rebel. To repent us from our compulsion to rebel. Chapter 17, verse number 12, and we'll be done. And the children, so he had in chapter, in verse number 10, he took that rod and put it out there as a token. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Repented of their rebellion. I said, oh my. We see that token. We see what happened. We repent. We're dying. We're under such conviction. The token against the rebels help us repent from our compulsion to rebel. Just a warning. I said, God, has, I believe has given this tonight for us for the most part, preemptive. But I can see that there are some rebellion. And as Moses saw the people rebel against God, it saddened his heart. But let's learn tonight, as God says, here's a token, here's a flag, here's a warning, here's a memorial against the rebel. God still loves the rebel. By the way, I'm glad. So he still loves me. <laughs> but God says, I want you, I got a token for you. A flag, a remembrance against the rebels. Let's be careful. Let's take that token and watch ourselves. Lest we follow Korah. Lest we follow the congregation to rebel against God. Let's bow our heads, please. Mm-hmm.